I want to welcome everybody to the College of Design. Uh, my name is Scott Marble. I'm the chair of the School of Architecture. Um, and it's a great, uh, I'm really happy to, to uh, uh, be part of this event. It was very much a kind of a group effort. Uh, but as you know, we're here to, um, to kind of celebrate and discuss uh, the new book by uh, Jonathan Rose, uh, The Well-Tempered City. Um, th as I mentioned, this, uh, this was very much a group effort uh, um, uh, between us, the School of Architecture, between the School of City and Regional Planning, uh, between the Urban Land Institute and the uh, Enterprise Community Partners. And I especially want to uh, have a shout out to uh, Adam Guy, who really helped put this thing together. I don't know where Adam is. He's back in the back, of course, making sure everything's going okay. Um, so I'm just going to give a short introduction here, but I think it's a, um, uh, knowing what this book is about and what it addresses, I think it's a really well-timed, uh, uh, it's, it's well-timed in terms of what's going on in the world and actually what's going on in Atlanta. Uh, and I know Jonathan's going around to different cities and talking about his book, and I think that on the one hand, the, the book discusses issues you know, at a global scale, but, but what, uh, how it affects the different places around the country in the United States is also equally important. And I think Atlanta, I'm new to Atlanta, I'm, I came from New York, spending 30-something years there, and so when I look at Atlanta, and Atlanta is one of these cities that is really about to, in my opinion, kind of emerge into a really uh, kind of a, a sort of model city for what kind of density and urban growth can be, and a city that's really known more for its sprawl. So I think it's, it's, it's very important that this is being discussed in Atlanta at this time. Um, it, yeah. So the, the, music, the music is important, actually. You'll see why in a second. Um, so um, this book came out in two, 2016, this year. And it's, and it's kind of amazing how many reviews that it already has, not only from uh, different media outlets and magazines and journals and newspapers, but also from individuals. Um, I won't go through all of them because it's a long list, but... but uh, uh, it's been reviewed by Fortune, by the Huffington uh, Post, by the Washington Post, and by individuals that range from Paul Hawken to Arthur Siegel, who is a professor at Harvard Business School. Uh, and most, I think, telling and relevant to the music you just heard by avant-garde artists um, Philip Glass and Lori Anderson. So, you know, with that range of people that are reviewing and commenting on this book in very positive ways, it's clear that this is not, you know, an ordinary book. Um, so the format of the evening is going to be a discussion between Jonathan, um, between Jonathan and Sarah Kirsch from the Urban Land Institute here in, um, in, in, in Atlanta. So I want to give a very short bio for Jonathan, and most of you know this, but I think it's important just to, to for those of you who don't, to understand what he does. Um, so Jonathan works with cities and nonprofits uh, to plan and build affordable and mixed income green housing and cultural health and education centers. Recognized for creating communities that literally heal both residents and neighborhoods, Rose is one of the nation's leading thinkers on the integration of environmental, social, and economic solutions to urban development issues facing us today. In 1989, he founded Jonathan Rose Companies, a multidisciplinary real estate um, development, planning, and investment firm, which creates real estate and planning models to address the challenges of, our, of the 21st century. Um, his firm has received awards from the Urban Land Institute, the American Institute of Architects, the American Planning Association, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and many others. So again, the range of of organizations and the range of, of kind of uh, disciplines that he touches is, is really quite stunning. So, um, and Sarah, a lot of you know Sarah because she's an uh, at Atlanta, but Sarah is the executive director of ULI in Atlanta, which is one of the nation's um, uh, largest and most active uh, district councils of the, of the ULI. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah and Jonathan to start their discussion. Can you all hear me? Yes. 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 Yes.
Thank you. Okay, we're on. All right. Well, thank you so much to Georgia Tech and Enterprise Community Partners for organizing and hosting us today. Um, Jonathan, welcome to Atlanta. We are so pleased that you're here. As Scott said, it's such a timely discussion for so many reasons. Um, and despite my raspy voice, it is a real honor to have the opportunity to sit down and talk to you about the well-tempered city. Um, I knew of the title before I read the book, and I don't know about you, but things sort of rattle around in your brain once you hear titles, and you go, what is that about? And I imagine that when you came up with the title, you had no idea that temperament and being well-tempered would be such a topic of national discussion. Um, but that's not what you mean by well-tempered, right? No, it's, it's actually, but I love, I'm, I'm a punster. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll tell you what I mean by well-tempered, but I, the book is going through many, many iterations, and I had a very strong editor, which is very, very helpful, too. But there was a point in which each section was a play on the So I had a section on climate change that was about temperature and temperament. And I had a section about social civility, which is about well-tempered people. And, 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 and actually, interestingly, when you temper steel, that's what makes it more resilient. So my resilient section was about that version of temperament. So anyway, I had all these different plays on the word temperament, and then I thought that was too cute, and I gave it up. <laughs> but here's the core of the idea of temperament. Um, Pythagoras, who was a great mathematician, in about 25, I'm sorry, 500 BC, actually figured out that the distance between the notes on a lyre was in the same proportion as the distance between the planets. Which is actually kind of amazing, because how do you figure that out anyway? And he was correct. And he therefore said there's a golden proportion that exists throughout all of nature, and he was kind of correct. There is a proportion that we do actually see as this ratio manifests itself in many, but not all, parts of nature. And since he proclaimed this, everybody believed it, and therefore, for the next uh, 2,000 years of musical history, in Western music, instruments were tuned to this ratio, and they sounded perfect in their own keys, but each key was slightly off, and they sounded horrible if you played them together. In the late 1500s, a musical system, a, a mathematician addressed this problem in China. His solution came through Europe, and around, I'm um, sorry, like 1600s, and in about 1700, this idea of musical temperament emerged, which was tuning in between that allowed all the keys to be played together. And it unleashed an incredible amount of, um, it was like a new system. It was a new operating system for music. And Bach, who had this incredible vision, Bach, purpose in life was to capture the harmony of the universe, the architecture of creation, and turn it into music for humans to hear on Earth. And all of a sudden, he had this new, incredible, integrative tool that dramatically expanded his capacities. And he also had a new technology called the clavier, which is the forerunner of the piano. So I took this analogy of a new operating system and a new technology that was hugely integrative and said, how could we, that we needed something like that for our cities. And anybody who works in cities will tell you how frustrating the silos are that the funding that comes from Washington for housing can't be integrated with transportation and can't be integrated with parks and open space, and that we, the environmental impact statements, which I'm not a fan of, actually force us to analyze things in silos. And so, looking for an, I use this as an analogy for the great integration that we need to solve our problems. Great integration is a, a great concept. Um, we heard reference some of the reviews that have been written about the book. Um, one that struck me was, of all people, Edward Morton Jr. provided a, a review of it. I feel like I'm a little bit inside the actor's studio. So, um, In the beginning of his quote, he references someone else. He says, someone once said that the ideal city is, quote, a garden for growing better people. And I thought that was such a wonderful concept, a garden for growing better people. We don't tend to think of our cities as being people-based. Um, Atlanta is often referred to as a, a city in a park. Right. Um, I remember Duani was here about 10 years ago and gave a keynote, and he observed that Atlanta was the negative image of Manhattan, mm -hmm. that Manhattan is all urbanity with a stretch of park in the middle, and we are Peachtree, our stretch of urbanity in the midst of a big park. 
so I thought this was a particularly interesting observation of the role of nature. And you talk a lot about that in your book, of the role of nature in creating resilient cities and resilient people. Can you tell us more about that concept and, and where that comes from for you and where you see it playing out? Yes. So first of all, by the way, Edward Norton Jr. is the grandson of Jim Rouse, who's the founder of Enterprise. And it was his grandfather who said that that cities are the gardens for growing people. Amazing. So and Edward, is, Edward is actually an amazing urbanist and deeply understands the issues of affordable housing and can sit and discuss with you tax credit policy and why there's not enough home money and all that. So Great, great advocate in all sorts of venues. Exactly. Venues. So um, I believe the solution to the, so let's lay some of the issues out first of all. The global population will be 10 billion by 2050, we project. We don't really know, but we project. And we know the climate is rapidly changing, and we know that income inequality is growing. We know that there's enormous consumption. Uh, as the world becomes more middle class, it's buying more stuff, and we're using up more of nature. And that there are many things that are out of balance, and that we have to find a new balance. And it's very clear to me that key to that balance is building denser, more mixed use, mixed income, walkable communities that are connected by mass transit. That's not a new idea, that idea has been around for a while. But the only way you can sell that and make that livable, palpable, whole and, and healing is that it has to be suffused with nature. And we actually are seeing examples where cities are densifying and adding more parks and open space. And not just parks and open space as the human creation. We actually have to bring biodiversity itself back to the fabric of our cities. Uh, I'm going to give you a very simple example, and that is we know that neighborhoods that have more trees uh, are six degrees cooler than neighborhoods without trees in the summer. We know that they um, that climate change and climate change is going to increase the heat of our cities. We know that climate change it's changing the way it rains, so we're having much more intense rains, which is overwhelming our storm sewer systems. And we know that tree streets absorb storm water much better and reduce its impact on the systems. We know that trees absorb uh, pollution. They capture carbon. Uh, we know that neighborhoods with a lot of trees are, um, have better mental health statistics. Uh, we know that um, uh, they raise home values and that raises real estate taxes, which is better for the economics of since you all these amazing benefits that come from, from bringing nature back into neighborhoods. You can take that at all kinds of levels. And what we really what we see that it, there are two things about nature. So number one is nature in herself is part of the resilience of cities. We're now looking at cities like New York City that have water edges, and we're recognizing that Instead of building huge breakwaters, we do actually better to build natural edges that are more stormwater absorbing and, and, uh, and actually create parks and open space. So you get this double benefit of resilience and when it's not a storm, it's a nicer place for people to be. Um, and creates real estate values and really increases real estate taxes. But there's another part of nature and that nature has adaptive capacity. Um, Paul Hawk and I quoted Paul in the book, says that you know, when there's a forest fire, uh, nature naturally knows how to heal. Nature knows the sequence in which the grasses and then the bushes and then the small trees and the large trees and how it all heals back and grows. We, are, we as human civilization are missing that adaptive capacity. And I actually believe that's a lesson we need to learn from nature, to divine, design systems that have inherent adaptive capacity within them. So you mentioned the vision of clustering housing right. and its abuses around transit. Um, as you well know, Atlanta's history is very much as a transportation right. down, transportation hub. Um, you probably also know that our rail system was funded at the same time as, as BART and DC Metro, but we have not expanded in the way that... Um, not expanded yet. Not expanded yet, yet. So we, there's an opportunity on the ballot um, that people aren't talking about it. But, um, at the bottom of the ballot, for those of you who um, are thinking of maybe voting for one or two things, get to the bottom, um, to expand more of for really a once in a generation opportunity. Um, also on the ballot is T's Lost, which would, among other things, complete the right away for the belt line. Um, so what elements of 
transportation and transit specifically fit into a well-tempered city? And then I was curious how, you, know, you just talked about adaptability of nature. How do we reconcile that, that transit and other infrastructure are, seem like fixed systems, and how do we make them more adaptable over time? Okay. So the two questions. Seven. At okay. least two. So, um, so first of all, great, uh, I'm going to back up. So 20 million American families spend more than 50% of their income on housing. And they spend more than 20% of their income on transportation. So they're spending more than 70%, actually for the lower income families, up to 98% of their income on housing and transportation. It's impossible to move forward, to save, to have healthy food, to pay for kids' education, all that, when those are your costs. So transportation is an environmental issue. It's also a social equity issue. And it's a, it's a, and what's great is whenever you can find sweet spots where you, by solving one problem, you, by creating one solution, you solve multiple problems. That's a good thing. And the permeability, the, the distribution of the transit system is key. And we've seen in global cities, for example, the use of bus rapid transit in Curitiba and many other cities around the world, how uh, transformational transit can be. Um, I love rail systems. And I have much of my life, I know they were talking about cities and suburbs. Uh, I have lived in cities and I've lived in suburbs, but always near transit. And all of our work is next to um, rail systems. And you know, there's some amazing small suburban towns where you can just walk from the train station. I and mean, they can be really fantastic. But we can't afford all of that. So we have to think of our transit systems as an expanding market, but also thinking about what are the last mile connections to that? What are the streetcars and less expensive solutions? What are the bus systems? What are the bus rapid transit systems? You know, what are the bike systems? What are the walking systems? And, and really have a comprehensive sense for how those all feed together. Then your next question was, uh, but that's all fixed and yet the world is changing. And that brings us to the realm of the autonomous vehicle. Because the autonomous vehicle will be able to go anywhere and everywhere and wiggle around and adjust to human settlement uh, changes. Uh, and there is enormous opportunity within it and enormous danger within it. And the danger that I see is that I spend some time with the, um, the Silicon Valley guys who are all investing in and super, super excited about autonomous vehicles. But the reality is their economic model depends on utilization. And uh, the more of a utilization, the better. So your, my guess is within 10 years of the autonomous vehicles if Atlanta lets it, between Midtown and Buckhead going back and forth and running 24 hours a day, and they'll be like shared taxis. Uh, and they'll spread out to neighborhoods and stuff like that. But South Atlanta, uh, won't be economic, will not be perceived to be economically viable. And so it'll be the much, much later phase. And we will create another system of haves and haves nots in terms of transit access. So I believe it is really that essential when we think about transportation that we think about transportation equity. We're, we're covering some other, other questions, so this is great. Um, so the, the issue of social equity is very much alive and robust discussion locally. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think for two years running, Atlanta was highlighted as the most in, in equal city. I think we dropped down to number two. Still a dubious distinction. Um, but in your book, you, you talk about all the reasons that, that equity matters, but you also talk about having a pervasive sense of altruistic purpose. And within that, this notion that cities, not just individuals, but cities that need to develop a culture that balances the we and the me. And that's a fascinating um, issue to think of how one cultivates a city culture that balances the we and the me. Um, so I, I guess if you can just sort of expand upon that and, okay. and what you mean. And, and I'm going to give you a longer answer to get there. Perfect. But, okay. So, uh, the environmental advocates have set a goal that by 2050, cities 
uh, use, uh, create 80% pure greenhouse gases than they did in 1990. And we have systems for measuring that, and we can track our progress, and we have preliminary ideas of how to get there. We know transit helps, and we know green buildings help, and we know more trees help, and we know a lot of, we haven't figured it all out, but we have a set of goal. I don't know of a city that has set a similar equity goal. We know how to measure equity and balance, but I don't know of a city that has said we so one way to start is to actually put that on as an objective of who you want to be as a city. And then to make public, just as we do our climate goals, and there are a thousand cities that signed on to the climate goal, so there should be a thousand cities that sign on to an equity goal. So that's step one, is to actually acknowledge the issues and measure them. Step two is to, uh, I'm gonna get the altruism question eventually, um, is uh, does Atlanta have a community health index? A human community health indicators. So many cities have been adopting this thing of community health indicators. And the Bloomberg Foundation actually recently ran a competition for them, and um, Santa Monica won, and then they're investing more. So this is where a city actually defines through a community public process all the things that matter to be a healthy city. So um, uh, the Gini index or equity and balance is one, and affordable housing is another, transit accessibility is another, but also the percentage of opiate addiction is another, and the, the number of school kids in the public school who are taking um, uh, advanced placement courses is another, the percentage of off uh, presidential year vote not, uh, voter participation is another. You, you can um, define many, many measures, communities do, and there's no, it's not like you gotta choose my measure versus your measure, they all matter. And we have enough data now with the Internet of Things and public health data and housing data and transportation data, all that. We get the amount of traffic they measure and greenhouse gases. You can see all those things and we can actually try track our progress towards a better collective state of well-being. So I believe number one is having a vision as to what that better collective state of well-being is on multiple areas. And then tracking our progress so we know that we're getting closer or farther away. I believe that there is a bell curve of human nature. And some of us, by our very nature, are Mother Teresa's and Dalai Lama's. And some of us, by our very nature, are others. <laughs> On the other end of the spectrum. And, um, uh, so I'm actually saying I believe that Donald Trump actually represents <laughs> And the reason I say that is very important because I believe that there's a, this, this bell curve of human capacity and that we can shift that bell curve where there's no way no, we're all going to be altruists or we're all going to be a total selfish narcissists. But we can shift the bell curve of human, of, of our cities, of our common collective culture to one side or another. And even if you shift it 20 degrees, it makes a huge difference. So when John Kennedy said, ask not what your nation can do for you, but what you can do for your nation, we all shifted in that direction. When Martin Luther King said, we are tied together in an incredible web of mutuality, I didn't get that quote exactly right, we all shifted, we heard that, and we recognized that. And um, we need a public voice that says we are all in this together. First of all, we actually know from a data point of view we're all in it together. Uh, there's a, in the book, I quote a lot of data that shows um, that the more regionally equitable uh, regions are, the better the school performance, the better health performance, the better the job performance, the happier people are. The, <clears throat> this section in the book uh, that, that ties together prosperity numbers, uh, well-being index, and inequality index, and, and aims towards where are the sweet spots. And those are actually the places where people are happiest. So we know that this collective well-being um, is, is in all, is even in our selfish interests. But we need um, cultural institutions to call upon it, and, and um, uh, not only cultural institutions, all of our institutions. So I've been a member of ULI since the 70s. And I remember in, uh, and I believe that ULI has, for example, as an organization, has made that shift incredibly well. It is a real voice for the best of um, 
the whole of its regions. I've seen that. So when I joined ULI, it was all about kind of what I call maximization. You know, how could individual developers, it wasn't all about, but it was predominantly about how could individual developers you know, make the most money, do the best deal, have the shiniest building. And it has shifted to how can cities and communities be the best that they can be. Um, and that shifts the culture of real estate development. Uh, so um, in 1909, the citizens, the prosperous citizens of Chicago got together and created the Burnham Plan, not the city. I can give you many examples of amazing mayors who called on the collective good, who inspire their cities to act more for the whole, but I can equally give you examples of civic leadership that did the same. And also examples of spiritual leadership, and to me that is actually one of the roles of churches, synagogues, and mosques and temples, is to call upon the, us to be more compassionate. And if they can all work together to create a culture of common good, I think that I think that's achievable. What so dismayed me about this election is that it is giving it has until recently, and I feel tide shifting given permission to be nasty, being permission, given permission to be selfish, being given permission to, um, to demeaning others. And those <coughs> shake the roots, those destroy the roots of civilization. And what I hope will rise out of this is an affirmation that we have, there are many pathways of solutions. And that, the, um, and that we need them all. We need the most conservative, we need the most progressive. They each have something to contribute. But what we cannot do is, but they only, they will all thrive in the soil of compassion, altruism, and the understanding that we're all in it together. So I, I think you referenced this partially, but um, so the conversation around social equity, which you know, we can talk about housing, we can talk about a number of, of issues of access to opportunity, um, but you, you often in that discourse get pushback that, and I actually pulled out sort of an old business school thing that um, something called the executive's compass that called liberty and equity polar opposite values. And I mean, it's sort of this interesting discussion piece, but the decisions, the policy decisions are, are pitting those two things against each other. I think what you just said is that we've sort of evolved to a place where those are not competing interests per se, or the, the for instance, the private investment in the private sector has a, um, a greater role to play and um, a benefit from the, the well-tempered city, if you will. So first of all, uh, we live in two separate worlds. We live in the world of reality, and we live in the world of our mental models. And our mental model is actually not up to reality. So we make these constructs. So the idea of liberty and equity is just a mental model. It's just a construct. It's, it's a subdivision of the true nature of reality, which is much more complex and much more interwoven. And these are very useful tools, but we have to recognize they're, they're just they're they're just human inventions, and they're not necessarily reflecting reality. So actually, I don't. I actually believe that liberty and equity, if those are two things, are actually deeply interdependent. They're not two separate poles. Um, but here's what I also believe. I believe that America's promise to the world that, that we were founded as a nation of opportunity. It was a very, it was a very biased opportunity when we were founded. We, we an ex sense of opportunity. Uh, over time, we have expanded who that opportunity is for. That expansion is deeply imperfect. But in general, the tradition has been to expand that opportunity. If you look at zip code maps, and the New York Times has an upshot column called The Upshot that has run an amazing series of zip code maps, or county maps, in which uh, they'll show the difference between the best school and the worst school in America, the difference in lifespan. So the, the, the zip code with the highest lifespan band, average lifespan, versus the lowest average lifespan, there's a 20-year difference in lifespan. They show the difference between the opportunity for a child to earn more than their parents versus less. You can look at all these maps, and, and you'll see these stark red areas where things are really bad, and these 
beautiful green areas or white blue or whatever where things are really good. The, the disparity is astounding. So I believe in America of opportunity where the opportunity of a child to thrive, for every, our goal should be to completely equalize that. I actually believe that is the foundation of the, that's not the opposition of liberty, that's the foundation of liberty. It's actually unimaginable to me that, that one would think that that's not the foundation of liberty. Now to get there, what that means is every school has to be equally good. Finland has the best school system in the world, best outcomes. And the reason is because whether you're in the wealthiest Finnish neighborhood or the poorest Finnish neighborhood, the most Finnish neighborhood or the most immigrant neighborhood, the schools are equally good, the outcomes are equally good. That's not true in America. Imagine if that was the same in our healthcare system. Imagine if our parks and open space were not allocated you know, according to race and class, but were equally distributed throughout. Uh, and, and the transportation access was equally permeable. If we really set a goal of equalizing all the, and the same with affordable housing, all the constituents that we know are essential for to be the platform of opportunity. If we figured out how to equalize those, we won't, the outcomes won't all be equal. We're all different people. We come from different genetics and background. But I believe that is a promise of America. It is an unfulfilled promise, but it is the one that we must aspire to. And so, actually, I was planning on asking you sort of what does leadership of a well-tempered city look like? But I think that, I think you've covered it. Um, I'm going to give you an example of that. Okay, okay. So, uh, I'm going to give you two examples. So the first one is in America, and is Oklahoma City. So, uh, can you remember, I don't remember, what's the name of the mayor of Oklahoma City? Does anyone remember? It's Mike. Cornette. Pardon me? Cornette. Yeah, what's Nick his first name? Nick. Nick Cornette. Okay. So, and when did Nick Cornette become, I say, uh, I thought it was 2003, but when did he become mayor? Around 2003. So, the day after Nick Cornette became mayor, uh, he opened Men's Health Magazine and saw that his city was the fattest city in America. Right, yes. Okay, so he said, I don't want to be the mayor. I didn't go through all this to become the mayor of the fattest city in America. <laughs> How can we solve this problem? He says to his chief of staff, and the guy goes, this is, the guy comes back and says, boss, I researched it, and the answer is that uh, we need to be a walkable city. It turns out that's the, the key correlation. He goes, well, how do you become a walkable city? So he says, you need uh, some open space and parks downtown, you need beautiful sidewalks that are tree-lined, you need other things to go downtown, like a library, and that could help solve the problem. He says, okay, I, I guess that's how we're gonna solve the problem. And he goes out, he advocates for this, and he gets the community to actually pass a sales tax increase to pay for this, and he hires the best landscape architects from around the country and designs it beautifully. They create a fantastic library. They implement it with, you know, really, really well, and uh, it works. So then the business leaders come to them and they say, uh, you know, our kids uh, find Oklahoma City really boring. They go off to college, they never come back, and um, what do we do about that? So he says, the chief is half staff, go research this. And the guy comes back and says, you need centers of arts and, arts and culture, you need innovation labs, you need to convert old loft districts into new places, you need, you need restaurants. You, by the way, you need bars that stay open later than 10 o'clock at night. And um, so he says, Okay, we'll do this. He proposes another bond issue. It passes, and um, they implement that really well. And then people say the traffic around here sucks. It's really terrible. And then what about that? He says you need natural research and you need light rail. Anyway, and they pass a bond issue for that. And I don't know. We need affordable housing. So here's the point. Oklahoma City is the, when this started was the state that had Tim Hoff and Coburn, the most conservative and climate change disbelieving senators in the Senate. This was completely about a leader who looked up to the problems, searched the country for the best solutions without bias as to whether they were progressive agenda, conservative agenda, whatever, implemented them with excellence um, and built a public constituency for them. And there's a very important phrase in the book, it's called collective efficacy. And collective efficacy is what happens when a group of people come together and they act and they see that their action makes things better so that there's both the better that is created and the belief that you can make things better. And he um, exercised through leadership the act of collective efficacy 
that transformed Oklahoma City and continues to make amazing improvements. Um, so those leaders exist, and and all those you know whatever you you know all those people in a tax hating theoretically culture voted uh, consistently for tax increases to make their collective good better. The other example is that in 1990, Medellin, which was in Colombia, South America, was voted, the, was determined to be the most dangerous city in the world. It was overrun with drug cartels. It was a horrible, dangerous place to live. And in 2013, it was voted to be the greenest city in the world. And an extraordinary transformation. The city said in 1990, we were a city of death, and we want to become a city of life. And they figured out how to do that, and they said we're going to do it with equity. So they got rid of the drug dealers and brought back a very good system of justice. And then, for example, they noticed that the poor were living on very steep slopes and slums, and that they were disconnected, and that was part of their poverty. And there was no way to get roads to connect them, and so they were the first city to import Swiss ski gondolas and uh, connect, which is by the way, cheap form of transportation, and connect them to the slums, to the downtowns, and where the jobs were. And uh, by each uh, ski uh, lift stop, they built a school and a library. So they said your pathway is transportation and knowledge. And, um, and they are consistently aiming to be a greener city. They're actually have a whole parks and open space network and a more equitable city and a city that enhances life. If they can do that in 23 years, we need to imagine what Atlanta can do over its next 23 years. So that's a good segue. I'm gonna ask about two more questions and then I'm gonna open it up to the audience. So be thinking about what it is that you've been dying to ask. Um, so we've been talking about cities, but um, perhaps we could also talk about regions, right? And it's no secret that we're sitting in the poster child of suburban sprawl. Right. Um, but our suburbs seem to be at a really interesting time. A one ULI member said to me just a couple weeks ago that our suburbs, our inner ring suburbs in particular, are in the crosshairs of urbanization. And it's this clash of social change and land use change and you know, that, that image of being in the crosshairs versus an image of being in a well-tempered place um, is, a, is a pretty powerful one. We have Ellen Dunham Jones sitting in front who's done the, the research across the, the country and the world for urbanization of the suburbs. But how, how do these concepts apply in redevelopment and in urbanization and in places that we wouldn't otherwise call a city? So, in fact, more Americans live in suburbs and cities. Um, right? Yes, and uh, we still have a lot of suburbs. The, the rebirth of cities around America is fantastic, but we have a lot of growth in the suburbs, and actually more than 50% of the growth is in the suburbs still. Oh, yeah. So, um, and so when I use the word city, I really mean metropolitan region, but the well-covered metropolitan region didn't. <laughs> so um, it's easier to talk about cities. But we know the cities and their suburbs are, and their regions, uh, ever since the word uh, Rusk is actually deeply interconnected. So. Um, and I grew up in uh, Westchester County, north of New York City, where the, all the suburbs were these incredible 1920s town villages uh, around transit stations. So to me, the model of a suburb was a very livable, walkable. My father, who worked in New York City, walked to the train station every day and uh, went to work that way. It was a very, uh, so I grew up in walkable, bikeable communities uh, as a model of suburbs. Uh, we're seeing in prosperous areas that urban villagification or townification of the suburbs is, is very successful. And it's got a lot of appeal and um, we, anyway, that's working very, very well. And, and we need to design those to be transit ready for you know, a much more transit connected future. You really, you really see this happen is in the Denver metropolitan region where Denver has this enormous rail system that is spreading all throughout the region and, and, uh, is, and the densification around the train stations is happening very well. And because of the work of Enterprise and others, there's a community land trust that's actually uh, buying land, not in every station, but doing the best it can to promote affordability. The inner ring suburbs, many of the older ones were actually built around town centers, which are now dying, and therefore can be re-enlivened around that. 
but many of them were not. And actually, as I flew in, what I saw were some dead malls. And when I left, there were about 3,000 dead malls in America. I'm sure there are more now. Um, what's interesting about the dead malls is they probably range from 12 to 120 acres. They're very well served with um, uh, utilities and infrastructure because they were uh, they um, they were on major transit nodes, car transit nodes, but they're on transit nodes. Um, and so those are and uh, typically the neighbors uh, would much rather have a mixed use, mixed income, new green development there than a dead mall. So they should be areas that is easiest to get entitlements from. So I, I think that's a very, and we've already seen some of that happen. Uh, the issue with that really is often ownership, that you have fractured ownership or a parking owner. You know. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But so the issue we really got to figure is that how do we get dead malls in the inner city rings out of the hands of the wrong owners and into the hands of people who can really transform them and bring them back? Like the Denver model. Or, right. yeah. And then the issue is we have to figure out how to uh, best connect them to their communities. Uh, the reason why I'm smiling is I decided to do this as an experiment. So in the 1990s, I bought a grocery and shopping mall outside of Denver. And the first thing I did is there was uh, bike trails nearby. So I connected the, that was a live mall to the bike trails and all these skateboarders came in and uh, teenagers on bikes and the merchants hated it. And they did everything they could to put fences and block the um, they, you know, yeah, the so then I also went to the parking lot, it was a big, terrible parking lot, and I, I got some parking spaces and I planted trees and made it a much beautiful, greener parking lot, and the merchants felt that it, it uh, blocked their signage, and so they cut the trees at night. And anyway, what I found is, uh, so it's better to work with a dead wall than rather than right. <laughs> <laughs> just be shop owners. Shop yeah. <laughs> um, so, but that's a very important point. I hold everything to what I call the developer's test, which is, it's actually got to really work. And the book is very aspirational, but every single thing I mentioned it has been built somewhere, uh, or could I actually really believe could be approved by the government, could be financed, and could be built. I think that's. I think we need to have huge vision and aspiration. And I think we have to ground it in absolute reality. So that was my next question. So we have the living building challenge here at Georgia Tech, which there's some right. uh, boards, you don't already know about it, you can learn about it afterwards, which certainly encompasses so many of the aspirational goals of what you're talking about. So how do we get those ideas out of the laboratory type situations? And what's the mechanism to get them more mainstream adoption? So first of all, we need to build demonstration models. Yeah. And that's why the Living Building Challenge is so great. And the Living Building Challenge, I believe, is the most aspirational of all the green building <laughs> goals. It's very aspirational, but it's fantastic. And it's really, um, uh, and as we build, uh, costs come down. And we, so when green building started, it was often thought as, as an additive process. We're going to put more solar on the roof, for example. And what we learned is it's actually a subtractive integrated process. So actually, if we build, use more insulation and use window shades, then we can downsize air conditioning. We can, uh, so, um, and Living Building Challenge is a great example of that. I want to, um, Asking your question again because I want to take it a different direction, but I want to make sure I answer your question. So your question was: How do we do a better job of getting ideas sort of out of the aspirational okay. and out of the laboratory okay. mechanism yeah. to getting this? So the first is uh, the collective institutions, and I go back again to enterprise, the urban land, student trust for the public land are fantastic idea distributors. So I was a very early. Um, I'm going to tell a secret, but it's obvious if I tell it won't be a secret. But anyway, I'm a, I was a very early developer of green buildings and affordable housing. And the affordable housing industry was very skeptical. That's a nice way of phrasing it. They actually hated the idea. Because at that time, we were building 100,000 affordable housing units a year. And they said, uh, we have a desperate crisis. And you're indulging yourself with this environmental stuff. And every time we build uh, 
you spend 1% of the budget on greening, uh, that's 1,000 families who won't get housed, and back then the belief was green buildings cost 10% more, so that's good. You, you, Jonathan Rose, by promoting your idea, are condemning 10,000 families a year to live out in the streets. Heavy, heavy load to bear. Right, okay. <laughs> so, here's the secret. So the secret is, which I guess not a secret anymore. So, actually I won't tell the secret. The bottom line is, <laughs> all right, I gotta tell the secret. So, I won an award, uh, for a group called by Global Green uh, for a green affordable housing project that I built. And um, Gorbachev was the patron saint of this organization, and Gorbachev was actually going to be the guy to give the award. But I could pick anybody I wanted to introduce me at the giving of the award, and then Gorbachev would give it. So I picked Mark Harvey, who was the head then of Enterprise Community Partners. And he was one of those guys who said, Jonathan, your green stuff is very nice, but unfortunately it's gonna put poor people out on the street. So Bart had to study this to be able to make a nice speech to give me the award. And, um, cause you know, Gorbachev, you know, like Bart showed up because Gorbachev, not for me, but because Gorbachev was here. <laughs> and in his studying, and Bart was a man of huge integrity in, in his study, and, uh, and the affordable housing that I built did not cost more and actually, uh, created all kinds of savings and quite beautiful and award-winning and all that stuff. So they won the award. And Bart then said, "You, there's really something here." And he then created the Enterprise Green Community Program. And he had a vision way beyond what I imagined. He launched it with 555 million dollars, and that was over 10 years ago. 500 million dollars of tax, low income housing tax credits, 50 million dollars of loans, and key 5 million dollars of grants that funded. Um, technical assistance and train people who had no idea how to be green, how to be green. Enterprise had another very brilliant idea, and that was, I've always said, form follows finance. He said if we green the sources of money, um, then the green will follow. So Enterprise went out and got to over 30 states to either require or give extra points for um, those applicants for low income housing tax credits who use the green community guideline. They did a whole series of things. Most of the major cities in America now require for you to use city money that you uh, build according to the green community guidelines. So they figured out where the leverage points were in the system and um, uh, affordable housing is the first field that is likely to go 100% green. It should have been houses of worship or wealthy people's houses or hospitals but it's affordable housing. So what we find is so these, there are intermediaries, there are knowledge networks that, um, that in the US Green Building Council we've seen do this thing. Uh, Urban Land Institute's been an incredible purveyor of green knowledge. So uh, the work that is learned by the uh, Living Building Challenge needs to, uh, it's great that it's being workshopped here in Atlanta, Georgia Tech. But then we need to spread that knowledge through these much larger learning systems. And then we need to begin to figure out what the true costs are and figure out how we transform the system. I have a belief, so um, our company built a, uh, a project that's written about in a book called Via Verde, which is a beautiful, very green building in uh, the South Bronx. It costs 7% more to create this extraordinary project. And a lot of the pushback I get is, well, the affordable housing world can't afford to build, spend 7% more to create amazing buildings. But I believe the affordable housing world can spend 7% more on one out of every 20 buildings to create amazing buildings because we've seen a ripple effect. The Via Verde neighborhood is now actually transformed. So what if we said the affordable housing world or the housing world is going to fund one out of every 20 buildings will be a living building challenge building. The cost will come down, the knowledge will go up, they will begin to distribute more broadly. And that's something, because we don't have to do it all or nothing. We can just get started. Just get started, okay. Um, questions from the audience. I have a couple more in my back pocket, but would love to open it up. I think I see one hand over here, so. And 
Yes, thank you. My name is Dr. Harry Garcia. I am with the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, uh, with the City of Atlanta, and uh, um, thank you for this insightful uh, talk about cities. Um, I, I current initiatives for the City of Atlanta, work with institutions like Georgia Tech, um, developing the Climate Action Plan, and uh, following international protocols that we never have the issue of equity. But luckily in Atlanta, we've been the leaders, and now we incorporate equity in aspects of the Climate Action Plan, universities like uh, Clark University and others. Um, but in my preliminary research, I have found that uh, we always talk in cities about transportation, which is a big issue, second emitter here in the city. Uh, but we never talk about food. And um, the food system, as a matter of fact, in, in my preliminary research, is indicating that we produce in even, even the same level, or um, probably more than transportation, in our supply chain system for food. Um, so my question for you is, have you considered food in, has, what's your vision for food for cities? And, and the other issue that we have here at Urban Agriculture Director, which is the only in the country, practically only in the country, we're trying to create this food system, but it's going to be a cultural shift, so I still debating how we can manage that, so I want to hear your insights about that. So I talk about the food system in the book, and interestingly, the two cities that produce the highest proportion of food for their residents within the city boundaries are our previous entities, Hanoi and Havana. Uh, but those are also tropical climates, which makes it easier to do. Um, the, uh, the benefits of local food are enormous in savings of transportation, uh, improved health, and, um, and particularly because food tends, you know, urban food tends to be grown collectively. So part of the collective efficacy comes from community gardens. Um, we're seeing some really interesting partnerships between housing, health, hospital, and community gardens. In Stanford, Connecticut, there's an amazing program in which there's a very large, there's like a acre or so community garden opposite a, well, a Hope Six project, um, tied into the hospital. And in the community garden, they not only grow food and teach healthy nutrition habits, they actually have a daily yoga class, a daily meditation class. So many, um, many aspects of well-being are tied together. And the reason the hospital is investing in this is because it's actually lowering health care costs. So I think we, need, you remember I started by saying the whole idea of temperament is that we need to integrate everything. So the big place, you know, by, I, the place to integrate everything to, one of the biggest places to do is healthcare. Because health is where the savings are. And more and more, I don't know if uh, Georgia's doing this, but more and more states are doing able under the, uh, you know, the Obamacare to do Medicaid innovation. Um, uh, in which I think one of the, uh, and anything that can save, that you can invest in that saves costs uh, for the healthcare system is a valid investment. And the food system, I think, is a very uh, natural investment for that. So this gets to the title that you said was supposed to be uh, the well-tempered metropolitan area that didn't sound so good. Um, and the issue of equity. And one of the real uh, challenges facing people who are supporting greening of cities is that um, corollary with that is that it often disrupts existing low-income communities and displaces them. And if they end up moving, the city becomes more equitable in the sense that the poor leave and you end up with a situation that's uh, perhaps on the in statistics more desirable but not in terms of how the whole system works and and the examples you've given are mostly project-based examples and I'm wondering if you could take this up a notch and talk about your vision for equity at the level of a metropolitan area and how you uh, sustain that in a way that um, that that isn't just about individual projects, but is about communities. It's a great question. So, um, equity has many sides to it, and one that I feel actually is the least talked about is small business ownership. So, what we see is as neighborhoods gentrify, one of the things is that small businesses get priced out and leave. And the solution we know where we can see where gentrification is coming. And one of the things I think we really need are, are low-cost um, 
loan programs for businesses to buy their buildings. And that number one means that even if their business doesn't thrive because their product is wrong for gentrification, they have equity, they will have equity in it and they will benefit uh, from it. And uh, two, so we see a lot of small business displacement as neighborhoods gentrify. That's number one. The second is um, we need to regionally focus on affordable housing preservation. We lose uh, we, about 12% of our affordable housing stock per decade to either gentrification or abandonment. So abandonment happens in the declining part. Um, and uh, uh, preservation is both more affordable and is a key piece. And uh, preservation dollars are very effective dollars and should come with 30 or 50 year uh, you know, restrictions on more permanent affordability. Uh, I am a believer in um, inclusionary zoning codes that also provide that new development uh, is mixed income. Um, and each of these is an imperfect tool. I actually don't believe we have figured out what is the perfect tool set. Uh, but, what's, but I've also not seen a region. So what I challenge this region to do is actually to say, here's where we are in terms of population distribution equity, affordable housing gap, small business ownership gap, et cetera. And here's the population growth that's coming, here's the prosperity that's coming, and here's where the trends are taking us. This is a perfect project for an institution like Georgia Tech with all the resources it has. And then what would it take for us in 2050 to be a completely equitable region? And what you will discover is what, will, what it will take will be beyond the resources that you think you have. But we need to pose that. We actually need to understand. And then what we're going to begin to find is the co-benefits and the co-efficiencies. And, um, and if that is really top of mind, uh, you will continually evolve and adapt towards the right solution. Wait, wait, you're next. Okay, next. Okay. Hey, what about that guy? Oh, it's equitable. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, just go ahead, Ellen. Go. Okay. Go ahead. Um, sorry, lots of potential questions. Thank you for all of this. But um, I wanted to ask, so for all the students in the room who absolutely want to take on the challenges that you have just laid out for us and for the region, what do you recommend that they study? Because should they, on the one hand, we all know that the most effective collaborative teams have people who have deep knowledge they're bringing to the table. They do have to, you know, so on the one, one model, you have to specialize, and frankly in school, get in that silo and really learn something deep, that, but with an attitude absolutely open to that collaboration? Or should they at least double major, so, you know, okay, they're breaking down two silos, at least. Or should they be liberal arts and go, go broad, because really, I mean, to be able to connect all the dots that you're talking about, you have to know about so many things. And maybe you'd answer by telling us, what, what did you study? I'll answer my, I'll tell you what I studied, but first, um, the answer to me is both. So I think you need, we live in a technical world and you need technical knowledge, and I think technical knowledge is entirely s sterile, unless in your own, so I had a meeting with uh, masters and PhD students before this talk, and what I said was, um, you need to have a vision of the whole and understand your piece of it. And you need to be really good at your piece. That's what gets you invited to be part of the team. But you continually have to keep understanding the relationship of your piece and the whole and thinking about the whole. And I also mentioned that um, most my book is heavily research uh, enriched, and I love doing the research. And the place I did the most research from I, is Science Magazine. It has a very broad article about all kinds of things. They're all scientifically accurate, but you can read anthropology and physics and all kinds of stuff. And uh, so I think reading science or nature actually is a really good thing to discipline to do, even though so much of that would be completely outside your field, or some other journals like that. 
and also read the New Yorker. Um, uh, these will give you a larger framework in which you can see where your piece fits. My undergraduate major was in psychology and philosophy. And, um, uh, but I, that was really a device for me to, uh, because it was a very open major at the time, to try and integrate all these things. And uh, I actually proposed a, as a senior thesis, which was rejected, um, the, uh, the base of this book. And it was rejected as being too big and too impossible. And most of the science that I needed did not exist. It's a complexity science, for example, systems theory. That a lot of it didn't exist at the time. I had imagined it, but it didn't exist. So I was really annoyed that they rejected it. But, um, ooh, okay, thanks. Tell me more about that. I was annoyed that they rejected it, but they were probably right. By having this larger vision that I then continued to grow my own expertise, and have a larger framework to put it in, was very useful. I then got a master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania where, um, where I went to study with Ian Ricard, the written design with nature, and that to me is another theme that has uh, existed throughout my life. Okay, so I mentioned I got rejected to do this thesis. And I got, I said, well, I don't want to stick around this place because it's, I, so I had a bunch of AP credits. I took my AP credits and I graduated. I left a semester early because I didn't, so I can't do my big thing. And um, went to Istanbul, and you could do what I described you can't do today. Uh, and then I got a job, I happen to know a lot about car mechanics and bus mechanics, and I got a job as an assistant bus driver and bus mechanic on a bus, on a hippie bus, going from Istanbul to Kathmandu. And I worked my way through the middle of the winter across Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, and into the Himalayas. And in that, saw an amazing range of cities and cultures and people. And fortunately, the bus broke down a lot, uh, which is great because like, I'd be in Tehran or Tabriz, and I'd have to go to the market and find used bus parts that hopefully could match this German bus and, and negotiate. It, it really immersed me in the culture. And I think that getting out in the world and kind of seeing cultures and seeing how the world works is also a really important part of the industry. So in between you and Donald Trump, there are a lot of developers who will never be tax credit developers, uh, will never have green building as their main focus, um, and they have a lot of uh, institutional um, motivations or prerogatives that they, you know, they have to meet. Um, do you have any advice for you know, those organizations as to I don't want to say low-hanging fruit, but you know things that they could actually do within their own framework to be better developers. So first of all, many of the world's most regular developers are becoming green developers because the market demands it, because it really doesn't cost more. It's about knowledge, and um, uh, and more and more regulations are demanding it. And um, so I don't see I don't see green development at all as this. Uh, extreme thing that only some people can do. I actually think it's something that everybody can do. Our company has funds that buy existing affordable housing, make it greener. And one of the things we do is we have a five-year payback cutoff. So we do anything, and, we, and even in buildings we built, we would, we're continuing looking for what can we do that pays back in five years. That is a 20% return on investment. And by the way, it's pretty guaranteed. Uh, when you take a you know piece of, like when you change compact fluorescent lights to LED lights and you put them on motion detectors and that pays back in two and a half years, that's actually a 40% return on investment. So I think there's a lot of stuff. The second, you know, another one is transit-oriented development. The customer wants transit-oriented development. I mean, so if you're just a regular world developer that wants to create a good product and know that it's gonna be more recession resilient, we, we've seen the green buildings next to transit rent better they're, they're more economic resilient. So I do think, just the example I gave in Oklahoma City, there's a lot of common sense things uh, that were perceived to be on the progressive agenda, but were actually just on the better city agenda. Real estate developers are adapting. Uh, and I really found that through ULI, I see developers all over the country doing things that 15 years ago were considered cutting edge that are just normal best practice now. 
Um, another interesting side of that, and this is a, another promotion for ULI, is the, I once got invited to meet with uh, um, the, the council of the real estate developers that builds the gated uh, golf course suburban communities. And I said, why do you want to meet with me? And they said, well, first of all, we recognize that our market is declining. And the growing market is in urban mixed use, mixed income, transitory development, and that's where we want to go. But they said, we have a special skill the other guys don't have, which is we know how to build a community. We actually know how to build, uh, well, I'll just leave it that. We know how to build real communities that people really love. Whereas you urban guys only know how to build single buildings. And they were right. So there, there are skills from all over the real estate industry we can bring together. I think we have time for one more question. Oh, I just want to say one more thing. In New York City, um, the way that tax code, real estate tax code works and financing works, if you're building rental housing until a recent incident, we've screwed this up, but for the last 30 years, the most profitable way to build rental housing was 80-20. So everybody did. So almost all the rental, the new rental housing built in New York City, 20% affordable. And so every, you know, related, and they're, you know, well, related to supportive housing group, but any, any regular old real estate developer building, market rate multifamily, was building 80-20. Um, uh, inclusionary zoning is coming to the Atlanta region. We're going, and, and I think that building 80-20 housing is, in many communities I'm seeing, in Seattle and San Francisco, in many places is just becoming a regular old market developer in the world. Hi, my name is Jean and thank you for your great talk. And because you uh, mentioned a lot about a lot about the integration, um, my Wait, question. I didn't understand what, a lot about what? In, in, integrated yeah, with yeah. a lot of things. And my question is that. Um, where the identity of the city comes from. Where the identity. Identity of the city comes from. Yeah. That's a really interesting question. Um, and there was a time when I went around and collected city identity. So cities have, like for example, Saskatchewan, Canada, says we are the potash capital of the world. I think that's a mediocre identity. <laughs> and it, it may be good for, you know, their product, but, uh, but, um, so partly, actually having a motto, this is, so, uh, there's an amazing work, it's in the, done by the Portland Sustainability Institute, where Portland ran these uh, community-based processes to, to decide who are we as a city, and what do we want to become, and what is our sustainable vision. And it really helped create an identity for who Portland is. I believe, so it can sometimes come from leadership and sometimes it comes from business, the business partnership that runs the city. But very often it also comes from a community-based process. I think cities, so tomorrow I'm going to Louisville and apparently Louisville wants to be known as a compassionate city. What a wonderful identity to have. Um, you know, then I'll go to Nashville, which is known as the music city. Sometimes the identity comes from something like an industry like that, but I actually believe that people can collectively decide this is their identity. I think it's a really good unifying process. It helps people know who they are. Does Atlanta have a phrase, we are the? City too busy to hate. That's a, the city too busy to hate is a fantastic identity. Um, I don't know if that's our true identity, but that's... No, 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 no. That, by the way, I quote that in the book, uh, that you're the city too busy to hate. But, but maybe there's more to what you could be. And it's really worth having a process to figure that out. Okay, I think we're going to have to stop there. But um, I just want to thank Jonathan and Sarah for the great discussion. And it will continue. Um, I want to mention that uh, after this event, we can all kind of go in mass over to the Clough Commons where the Living Building Challenge exhibit is on, so you can see that. And also Jonathan will be over there to uh, sign books and um, uh, autograph the book. So again, thank you guys for a great discussion. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you.